Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. This program goes out on our YouTube channel on Monday nights. On the show tonight, the theme is food and we'll look at the companies that Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets and Julia Lee from Birmingham Invest, the food companies they like. Do they like Costa Group, A2 Milk, or maybe Treasury Wine Estates? We'll see. And then we'll talk to the CEO of Domino's Pizza, Don May, at a time when the share price is really starting to pick up after being clobbered there for a couple of years. Let's just see if the share price can keep on keeping on going higher. And then Charlie Aitken and Paul Rickard will look at the food companies they think are worthwhile investing in. So without any further ado, let's go to Michael McCarthy and Julia Lee. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, I'm getting hungry and we're talking about food today. <laughs> <laughs> food I'm today. always Excellent. hungry. And, uh, and after you guys, I've got Don May on from, um, from Domino's, Domino's as well. Now, you liked Domino's a few weeks ago, I thought. Yeah, remember. look, Domino's has been an underperformer for the last few years, but yeah. nothing lasts forever. And it's Japanese business is doing well, mm. Europe looks like it's turned a corner, and it's even seeing a bit of improvement in Australia mm. as well. So, look, I think uh, Domino's is one that's poised to do well over the next year. Yeah. Now, I noticed on Gruen recently they they were of course taking the piss out of all pizza businesses, Pizza Hut, Domino's, but apparently they've got some camera now which actually photographs the pizza as it comes out and, and it can assess the condition. Because you know, I didn't realise, I was at my, my son's place recently and we were watching the State of Origin and when the pizza arrived, yeah, Marty was a bit cranky because the cheese had slid down so the, oh, the way they right. carried it in the box. It wasn't a Domino's pizza. No, it wasn't a Domino's, no. Yeah. But uh, obviously there is a lot of feedback mm -hmm. from customers. They don't want crappy looking pizzas and the delivery process, I guess, can do that. Absolutely. You, you know, you're, you're a big pizza eater. Well, I, 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 have actually, I, I actually tend to go to the artesian Italian pizza areas, right? Yeah, yeah. But I have ordered a couple of Domino's this year yeah. and they are quick. I'm pretty close, yeah. to be honest, yeah. uh, and they deliver a good product at a good price. Yeah. Now, um, you know, you're not going to get an artisan experience, but yeah. if you want good food, hot food, quick, mm -hmm. Domino's is the place to be. Yeah. And I think one of the big cases against Domino's and, and what drove the slide from $82 down to below 40 was the entrance of all these other food delivery b businesses, yeah. whether it was Uber Eats mm. or Deliveroo or, or whoever. Well, now, uh, Foodera, 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 yeah. they've left the market. Yeah. Uber are facing a court case that might decide that their delivery and drivers they and employees. And they charge a fair bit, don't they? They charge the, the restaurants 30%. Mm. Yeah. So I'm not sure that they've got a sustainable business model. I think part of the recovery in Domino's share price, one of the reasons mm. it's looking good, is that those models are not proving themselves up. Mm. And, and by the way, I hate to ever pick you up on something, but you said artesian pizzas, well, you meant artisan pizzas. <laughs> but, uh, the artesian... But I can get that in uh, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> but the artesian water is linked to food, so that's yeah, where you... Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. It's used so for... English for, level for lesson now over it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so all right, you, you kind of, you're liking the, the domino story, that there's not necessarily a company you're on board with. Is there a food company that you really like? Well, I'm sticking with Costa, Peter. I'm underwater on this one. Oh, I went yeah. in too early, but I'm taking up the uh, offer at 220. Right. Currently trading around 270, so that one's a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, and I, I like the long-term outlook. And I, and I would point out with a lot of these food companies that are directly related to the production side of things, they're suffering. Yeah. The drought is hitting everyone. Yeah. However, these are often cyclical businesses, and where investors have comfort around any stock that it's a cyclical rather than a structural yeah. issue, yeah. this is the time to be looking at. Them. How many downgrades have they had? Because often there's a number that people think, oh, uh, after <laughs> the third or fourth one, hey. Is, Three is, downgrades, a recapitalization, and new management, <laughs> then time to buy. Is That's that the rule? <laughs> <laughs> well, the last one was a cautionary one. They talked about the frost hitting the oranges in South Australia. Yeah. The damage wasn't material, yeah. but it says to me that the management is highly sensitive mm. to market information, and they're prepared to put it out there. Mm. That sort of mm. approach gives me confidence in management. I hate it when we see an earnings release or a press release that's all fun and games on the front three pages and you dig to the fourth page and there's a downgrade. Yeah. That really annoys me. And I like management who are upfront about the issues with their business. Yeah, and I, I guess the one thing about food and that they're growing as opposed to manufacturing in a factory is that you are a victim to a whole lot of variables which really aren't suited for the stock market in the sense that you've got to deliver every six months a result, but if it's a drought for three years, well, yeah. what can you yeah. do? 
I'll tell you one I really like that, Peter, which I bought on Friday, mm. is A2 Milk. Oh, oh, 80 milk is looking interesting at $12. here. $12. And you wrote about the Switch Report, I noticed, today I, I as well. I did too. Yeah. This one I really like. And yeah. Tell uh, us and why. This is a top team who've proven themselves again and again. They've got a very strong marketing strategy, although the Chief Marketing Officer has just departed. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, one year into her tenure, the new CEO appears to me to be keeping on with the strategy. Yeah. And they're looking for growth, particularly in the key markets in the US and China, and they're investing in it. And that's one of the reasons the share price is under pressure. Because of that investment in their business, the margins dropped from around 31% to about 28%. Yeah. I still like that margin. Yeah. And I think at $12, uh, A2 Milk is a very easy buy. Julia? I like A2 Milk and I like Freedom Foods, which is also related to A2 Milk and yeah. the nutritional side of the business, which yeah. I think will be a, a huge growth driver. Yeah. Anything nutritional is going to work in, in a modern space, isn't it? Yeah, well, when you can add value to a commoditized product, um, I mean, that's a huge advantage and it's also a marketing advantage, which a lot of these companies are because at the end of the day, milk powder is milk powder. Yeah. It's how you sell that milk to powder which gives you the the margin and the sales that come through but having a look at the food space it has been a really difficult place to be and I think Michael nailed it on the head that it's really dependent on your time frames are you looking at the next year or are you looking at the next 10 years and generally the time to buy sort of these drought hit businesses is on bad news the problem yeah. is that the drought has lasted a lot longer than anyone thought but yeah. look these things are cyclical mm. they're not structural in nature um, so things are looking like a bargain I'm not as brave as Michael um, this space has been We're a hard place <laughs> in the last 52 <laughs> Two weeks, this area is down about uh, up at 12% compared to the market, which has gained double that. Mm. Um, and if you have a look at the average return in the 10 stocks that make up the food index, um, a, a return of only 4% mm. over the and last the 12 top, months. The, of the top 10. Uh, the biggest 10 food companies yeah. that are listed on the market. Yeah. Out of those, the one I like at the moment um, is probably going to be another surprise given that I bagged Domino's a few weeks ago, mm. is our Coca-Cola Amatel. It's mm. another huge underperformer. Another one of my experts. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's been an underperformer for a number of reasons. The growth in Indonesia hasn't been crash hot. There's been extra competition coming here into <clears throat> Indonesia. And here in Australia, their product mix hasn't been fantastic. But add into that that commodity prices have been rising. Um, things like um, we've seen well, we've seen plastic prices rising because of oil price volatility. But um, we've seen commodity prices rising, and that's starting starting to um, become more subdued. So look, I think the initial earnings growth for Coca-Cola Amatel this year, return to earnings growth this financial year, yeah. is going to be <coughs> from the cost of inputs going down. But I think the next phase, and one I'm keeping an eye out for, is an increase in revenue. And that for me would be yeah. an extra um, increase in confidence. So not only are you going to see earnings growth return, but earnings growth really mm. on the back of costs coming down. But if you start to see that increasing revenue coming through, that would be a, a no-brainer for me. I think Alison Watkins will love to see what you're saying about it. Are you going to give Coca-Cola the thumbs up as well? No, you, you're eating a lot of pizza, you got to wash it down <laughs> with something. Well, oh, you're a beer man, aren't you? Well, I interviewed the CEO of Next Bar last week for okay. our podcast series. And I think there's structural change in that industry. Coke have grappled with it. You know, they've yeah. tried water. They've Why tried wouldn't they just go and buy Next Bar? That would make a lot of sense. But they, you know, their key, their flagship product is one of, you know, it's known as the black aspirin in, in, in trading circles. Yeah. But but it's sugar laden. Yeah. That's the reality yeah. of it. And so, uh, you know, I think they need to reinvent themselves to really look compelling to me. Mm -hmm. Having said that, they are beaten up and it is possible they're at the bottom of the earnings cycle. And of course, a turn is always good news for yeah. Shepard. Is there anything else before we wrap uh, it up? The other one I like is Grain Corp. Um, yeah. Look, we're looking at the second another crop. another drought play. Yes, this is another drought play. Uh, the second crop of, you know, um, underperformance in terms of grain corp. Uh, crops for grain corp, but there are signs of life there. They, they are looking to demerge malt co. Um, so that will be, I think, another driver of value. So at a time when things are pretty difficult, there are signs of life in terms of grain corp. So okay. that would be my top two at the moment. You, you know, one for the brave, mm. Ingham's. It's under You're not a so. chicken, are you? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to put my neck on the block. <laughs> <laughs> Ingham's have been under severe share price pressure, and there have been good reasons for that. Costs in particular have been a real problem mm. for them. Stock fees have been rocketing, uh, and that's really hitting their margin. Once again, if and when the drought turns, well, it will turn at some stage, they're likely to look very good at current prices. Okay. Might be too early, but I'm happy to put it up now.
Okay, it's Ma Malcolm McCarthy, the brave chicken. <laughs> 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 Julia, Julia Lee, who likes drinking Coca-Cola. Good on you, Julia. <laughs> well, that was Julia Lee and Malcolm McCarthy. And coming up after the break, the CEO of Domino's, Don May. Well, I'd like to invite you all to our first ever Switzer Small and Micro Cap Investor Day in Sydney on December 3. And we'll be giving investors access and insights to ASX listed companies where the CEOs will come and tell you, basically do a show and tell for the company, and you'll get a chance to ask questions about the company. The day will be made of 15 minute sessions, and as I say, the CEOs will present, and after that, you'll get a chance to ask questions. Julia Lee will be coming along as well, and she'll tell you how she picks out uh, small and micro cap companies. You can get your tickets from switzerevents.com.au. I hope I see you there. Domino's Pizza was a darling of the market, but then it went off the boil. And now it's making a bit of a comeback. So let's just see what the story is and was with the CEO, Don May. Don, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. All right, mate, so what happened to the company? As I said in my introduction, you know, you were a darling of the market, you then went off the boil, and then you made a comeback. So tell us what the story was. Yeah, I think we had a number of trip ups um, in different markets. So for example, in Japan, two Christmases ago, we, uh, we were making 48% of our profits in Japan on, in December, January. And we thought if we ran a limited menu, we could process even more orders because we, we, we had so much business coming through in such a short period of time. Um, and we thought we were smarter than, uh, than we really ended up being. And so as a result of that, we lost a lot of business in that Christmas and it was really material. Well, we recovered with that the next Christmas. You know, I, I often say to people, if, if we have a, a soft comp in our results, then um, that means that that's the soft comp now. If it's not something systemic, for example, long hot summers in Europe, well, next year that now means it's an easy comp to roll. It's not like there's a structurally something wrong in the business. So, you know, we, we had that in Japan. We had some um, same sort of things in, in Europe where we, um, we had a long hot summer in Europe, which infected our sales. Um, and uh, we also subsidized our franchisees in France to give them a boost playing in the long term. So some of these sort of cost lines um, had an impact. And then behind that, um, the Australian business, there's been a lot of commentary around franchise inquiries, around uh, wage underpayments. And I think those topics hung over our stock because still by and large, we've been growing quite significantly mm. over those three years. Well, I did a bit of homework before we came on. And in, in August 2016, you're a, nearly a $77 stock. Then um, July uh, 29, 2019, you went as low as $37 something, and you're now $51.39. It's interesting, when you look at where you were and where you fell to, that was a 51% fall in share price. Did the company ever get 51% worse? Did it get 51%? No, we didn't. <laughs> No, so it, we look. We don't really try to comment on share price, but yeah, during that whole period, we really did continue to grow. Yeah. So, it, you know, that's ultimately if you're investing in um, in Domino's in our business, um, that you know we have an intention to be over 5,000 stores in the nine countries that we now have the rights to, and um, you know when you, you look at that business, it's 340 million population. Mm -hmm. The GDP of those nine countries is larger than China and not that much smaller than the the US. And we're still running to that model. Yeah. It hasn't been a straight line. We did have some speeding fines, I suppose, some, some growth challenges in the way that we were delivering those earnings to shareholders. But all the way through, we've still continued to, to increase our profits year on year. We haven't gone backwards. Right. Um, so no, the, you know, whatever the company value was, it, it hasn't been worth less, yeah. I don't. Well, well Don, a time when you were really uh, firing, um, you, you, your delivery system was second to none. And I figured because it was so good and you really didn't have any rivals then, you probably sold a hell of a lot of pizza. But with the arrival of the likes of Uber Eats and Deliveroo, I figured that you had more rivals, that more businesses could take uh, their product to market like you were when you didn't have any rivals. So did the, did the arrival of Uber Eats and, the, and Deliveroo uh, undermine your business for a while? 
No, and this is one of the most misunderstood things about our business. We, we understand why people think this way, because mm. you're right, Domino's um, almost had the whole market to itself. Yeah. We're the leaders by far. And so with the arrival of aggregation and other players, the perception is, well, I'm seeing more of them in the street. Surely that's attacking Domino's. But it, it's actually almost a reverse, and let me explain why. And, and, and I can point to data that, that hopefully makes this clearer. For example, we grew our top line last year by 12%. And inside that, our online business grew by 18%. Now, these are not on small bases. You know, we, we did almost $3 billion Australian dollars in network sales, and over $2 billion of that was online, and that grew by 18%. So if we're being attacked by online, shouldn't our online be, uh, you know, even just growing even at our 12%? So that's one number we can point to. But let, let me tell you why there's a misunderstanding here is that, um, in the in the days of the analog world, before we got into digital, we were actually facing quite a significant headwind in that delivery was in decline. And the way we grew our business was actually through carryout. So at our peak, 70% of our sales came through pickup at our peak of the carryout uh, business. Well, in the digital world today, since you know online ordering, and we've been one of the pioneers of that, delivery is now booming. So whilst if you look anywhere in the world, people aren't eating a lot more food. Takeaway food's only growing in and around a percent. But inside that, there's a migration from the analog uh, process of the most convenient used to be a drive-through or picking it up from a restaurant to now digitizing. And we're seeing numbers of you know, 20, 30, 40, in some cases, 80% in growth in a given year. That's not a net growth to food consumption. That's just customers switching from picking it up, going for a drive-through, but instead now getting it digitally delivered. So when you've got this really large uh, growth, well, that's a tailwind behind us now because that's a place that we go shopping. That's the way we go fishing and we're really good at that. So if you look at um, both of, 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 so we have um, online pickup and online delivery and inside the uh, our business, delivery is just booming. It's double digit, including in Australia. Mm. Um, and we have had some decline in our carryout and that's been some of our own uh, mistakes that we've made there and, and uh, in the Australian business, um, which we're now uh, dealing with. We talked to shareholders about that in the, in the last half, so we're now seeing that momentum back. But yeah, we're, we're experiencing strong growth and we're, we're experiencing it both in our own online platforms, our online platform, our own technologies that you referred to continue to grow significantly. And then we also go shopping inside the aggregator and that's also growing, but they're not an either or. So then, as I said, we, we grew 18% last year in online sales growth, of big numbers. These, our total sales growth last year was our sales when we listed the company in 2005. So we grew in one year what we, what we listed our business with. Okay, so, so how are costs going? This digital world always seems so appealing on one level, but what's the cost implication for, you, for Domino's? Yeah, so one of the benefits is that because we own our own platform, the cost of an acquisition of an auto or the processing cost is less than a percent. And the savings we get from that are significant. Um, we not only get a higher ticket average, we make less mistakes with the digital order, and then it's also more efficient through our stores because we skip the phone straight to our make or monitor, and we can do all sorts of different things with being able to get that data and market to the customer. So for us, it's been far more efficient. Um, and that's been why we've been so profitable this last decade um, of, of supporting digital growth. And it's, and it's not stopping, and that is still the engine behind us. Okay, what are the opportunities for you guys going forward? Well, we've still got a race to, to get better distribution. So as penetrated as people think we are, we're still the fourth biggest fast food company in Australia. We're not the biggest. In fact, um, the burger leader is five times bigger than us. The fried chicken leader is two and a half times bigger than us. The sandwich leader is two and a half times bigger than us. And pizza in Australia, whilst it's it's very domino centric, pizza's underweight compared to other developed markets. So typically burgers is number one, pizza's number two, chicken's number three. In Australia, chicken's number two. And that's because in the analog world, the leaders in, in burgers and chicken did a much better job in the analog world or with large drive through in Australia and so on. Um, whereas in the digital world, this is where we're leading. We, we own our own platforms where, where you know, we're getting more and more efficient. So we actually still need more units to get closer to the customer um, so that we can make sure we're taking advantage of this. Right. That's the Australian New Zealand story. If you go to Japan, we're the market leader, but we're still really small. We've only got 620 stores today. We've given an outlook of a thousand stores. Um, and 
to be honest, that's the first coverage of Japan. Mm. Once we get towards a thousand stores, then the question will be, do we have enough scale and so on? Will that take us to a bigger place or is that actually maturation of pizza consumption? And then in Europe, we're market leader in the Netherlands, Belgium, France and Germany. But once again, we're still so tiny in France and Germany. So yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's literally continuing to not be complacent, continue to develop our own technology platforms. So we're about to launch next year our third generation um, of web and app, um, which will bring you know all sorts of new interesting things for our customers. So continuing to play in that space, but still continuing to get more efficient, get to the customer faster, um, which means we also get to the customer with a higher quality product, continue to invest in our product. Um, what I can share with you, when you and I would have spoken two years ago, I would have shared with you that we were also looking for other concepts. So we used to think, well, would we only be, uh, you know, we, would we be a second brand rather than just being only Domino's? What I can say to you in 2019, we're saying to shareholders, no, absolutely, we're just going to remain Domino's. Um, we have so much growth ahead of us. We still have opportunities to buy other markets as well. Um, so, yeah, it's all about focus and execution against Domino's. Okay, one last thing. You, you know that there has been a growing trend uh, for people to believe in uh, uh, healthy alternatives. So yes. what have you done in that space to broaden your potential market? Yeah, so for us, it, it, you know, diets are varying by the customer. There used to be it was almost always low fat. So if we went back a decade ago, we were reducing fat in our cheese. Um, we used to talk about what we called the stain of regret in the bottom of a pizza box. So when you finish a pizza, if you saw an oily stain, you thought, oh, geez, I haven't eaten what I should have eaten. And we almost removed that over the last decade. But today, um, health means a variety of different things. So we have a vegan menu. We have gluten-free crusts. Um, we have plant-based meats. Um, we've still got um, our lower fat products. So we're going to continue to innovate in that space at the pace the customer requires it from us um, and make sure that we're a leader. So yeah, we continue to work on other products as well. Um, you know, the, the, the trend to higher protein um, as well for some consumers, but health isn't one thing to, to the whole nation or in each country. Mm. One last thing, Don, uh, when the dollar falls, does it help your overall profitability uh, in Australia? Well, we're, we're fortunate that more than half our earnings now come from Japan and Europe. Yeah. So always, yeah, we're getting a big benefit from that. On the Australian business itself, um, well, we, we buy food mostly in USD because, you know, even um, cheese is, is in US dollars. Um, when, when the Aussie dollar um, is, is weakening, that means Australian exports are, uh, you know, more competitive. So that puts uh, pressure back on protein costs. The good news is, at least in the next 12 months, um, we've, we're pretty covered in, in, in how we can deal with that quite, you know, we, we're dealing with that quite manageably. Yeah. So we're probably going to benefit more from a, a, a weaker Aussie dollar. But in the longer term, um, yeah, Australia will get some pressure from that. But the fastest growth is still coming from overseas. So more euros, more yen. Of course, depends on what happens with the euro and yen as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so far, we're, we're, we're pretty counterbalanced in both. Don May from Domino's, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Well, that was Don May from Domino's, and now we're going to talk to two guys who watch the market very astutely in Charlie Aiken of Aiken Investment Management and our own Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report. Guys, got a view on Domino's? No, not a strong one. It's obviously had a good run the last three months, big short position in it. Mm. Obviously, the, the management team delivered a little bit better outcomes than people were, were expecting. And mm. look, it's but not for me, really. I think there's other global quick service restaurants I can invest in, and yeah. it's pretty specific to Australia and Europe. And mm. I think that it just looks a touch expensive well, to me now. Well, I brought the subject that you might notice when I was talking to Don, that they seem to have it all to themselves when there's no Uber Eats and Deliveroo. But mm. since they've come on the scene, there's been more competition, but he seems to think he's, he's got past that challenge, Paul. Yeah, look, I don't think that's a big issue for anyone in the uh, in the food business, Peter, with uh, Uber Eats, because they're taking, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the revenue, of the gross revenue the yeah. customer is paying, which makes it pretty hard if you're in the business of actually preparing and selling food when mm. uh, you can't put your prices up and you're now paying Uber to uh, get the order. So. Yeah. Uh, look, I know Domino's have got other ways of delivering and, um, mm. and fighting back, but uh, I, I think there's a few headwinds in that business. That's yeah. just my take, Peter. Okay. So I, I asked you guys to, to think about this sector. And it, was there any company that you either like or you didn't like? So, Charlie, have you got any surprise 
food related well, businesses. Yeah, it is food and beverage. Mm. I, I, yeah. we, have, we have an investment in Coca Cola in America, and, co and I think Coca Cola is starting to do a little bit better actually in terms of no calorie drinks, low sugar drinks, sports drinks, mm. tea, water. It's moving away from this carbonated mm. soft drink, high sucrose food play. Yeah. Plus, as well, sugar prices have come down, yeah. aluminium prices have come down for the cans, mm -hmm. recycling rebates are going up in the world. It just looks like a bit of a better volume and margin story. Not terribly expensive. That actually applies to Coca-Cola Amatol here. Yeah. It's basically the same thing, but yeah. the, the, bot the bottling version yeah. rather than the syrup provider. Yeah. So I think both the Coca-Colas in, in the US and here look reasonably and, interesting. And they have a powerful distribution network in HL. They, they, they basically own space in the refrigerators of so many we'll businesses. provide the refrigerators yeah. too, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I think that's a that's a brand that you know people associate with fast food, and that's right. Mm. And you know, mm. but I think they're changing their ways, and they're moving to better volume growth, better margins. It's just a bit interesting as they diversify their um, yeah. diversify their product range. So we own Coca Cola, and it's doing okay. Yeah, I wonder if Sally Watkins is thinking about a, a little uh, promotion like things go healthier with Coke. No, I don't. Mean, <laughs> I'm not sure anyone can come up with that. It might work <laughs> for a new generation. I think, I think yeah, the, the, with the Coke story, the, the no sugar campaign mm. worked pretty well. That, yeah. that, that drink has been incredibly popular. It's yeah. actually quite nice. It's actually, I, 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 I actually I think no there it is. <laughs> Coke no sugar is all right. It is it's all right. right. Yeah. But uh, I don't know what else it contains, yeah. Peter. That's probably doing something. Three out of two money men <laughs> should be just stupid enough to drink Coke. Should be called Coke <laughs> everything else. Coke <laughs> everything else. But look, I mean, I think Coke has had its, the local version right. of Coke's had its own challenges, particularly mm. in Indonesia, and which mm. has proved to be very disappointing. Where it's a number two yeah. behind the Pepsi equivalent, mm. uh, and I think there's still challenges there. The, so look, I own shares, and for disclosure reasons, but I do own shares in Coca-Cola Amatil. Yeah. But I did mm. have noticed, particularly as Charlie said, the number of companies that seem to be now shareholders about Coke in the US. Mm. So there's obviously something changed. Came back to your food stocks, Peter. Uh, I'm still an A2 uh, milk person. Mm. Um, it hasn't done much since I first tipped it on this program. In fact, it's probably come down a bit. But it seems like it's starting to find a bit of support around about $12. I think there are some challenges in that market, mm. but uh, there are other competitors coming into it. But sometimes new competitors coming into a category can actually be good for business because it does drive momentum. I, what I liked about uh, A2 milk was they were disciplined to exit their European and UK business. So mm. they said, look, We've got two markets to focus on, the US and China. Um, I think the marketing story in China looks pretty good, despite all the issues with the, you know, the, we all, lots of uncertainty about regulation and what yeah. happened there, but I think they actually know what they're talking about. And they're just scratching the surface in the US and, uh, and despite other competitors, I think that's actually could be a positive. So I think there's a good mm. success story there and a good good management team. Charlie, you have a view on A2 as well, don't you? Oh, yeah, look, I'm a little bit different to Paul, but I don't, we sold out of it at $16 and I haven't bought back into it. Mm. I'm just watching it. I think it's an interesting stock. I think. When I'm, would you get excited? Well, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not sure at the moment because I don't know how much they're going to have to spend on marketing to really make these market share gains. Mm. I'm not against it. I'm just, I'm just waiting for a bit more of a margin of safety, I think. Well, I'm I not sure whether I'm going to get that or not. Yeah, I mean, look, no, it's, I'm not it's, sure. it's not doing a lot in price yeah, terms. Right, it's, yeah. it's on the nose still with a lot of people. Mm. And, yeah. uh, you know, some of the technicians still say it's rather bearish, and you know, and uh, so I'm, I, I, I tipped it a little bit higher than this. Mm. I haven't quite got in, but it's it's a stock on, on mm. my watch list. Peter. So, so Charlie, when, when you you're asked to run down the shop and get some milk for the family, do you think uh, I'm going to buy A2 milk? Yeah, well, I actually have fallen for that, and I do buy A2 milk at a higher price. I, do, I, do I, have, exactly. I have completely fallen yeah, for that. I, I'm yeah. For no apparent company. reason. Right. It doesn't make me no, feel no, better, it, it doesn't do anything. But, no, there is. It, there, oh. like, it, Ross it, Walker, it, the it, cardiologist, it, says the A2 milk is Charlie, actually better for It makes for you feel yeah. a lot less tired. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> no, no. No, no, it's yeah. good for people who've got allergens, and not yeah. allergens. No, I do buy the A2 milk, I have to say. Okay, yeah. so that marketing has worked. Yeah. Yep. Or if you, you get a I like, the, I like the picture. I like. I'm not. Sh I have read what a, the, a, the second protein or yeah. the addition of the yeah. second protein or taking away does. But uh, look, it allegedly is better for you. The, the market that I think is uh, apparently about 25 percent of people mm. uh, can't shouldn't be using the normal milk yeah. according to what they say. So. This is what the promotional stuff says. Okay. So it's not all right. me. I, I'm all, right. all about well, milk. Let's stop me. doing as for to any other company's worth. Well, what I wouldn't mentioned. touch is Costa Group. The, the, I mean, I just, I think in my history in share markets in Australia in about 25 years, 
I cannot remember an agricultural production stock that anyone has made money out of, mm. outside of maybe owning the terminals and grain corp, but even that's been hard work. Yeah. Costa know, Group for a short time was a darling, wasn't it? And it did was well. because it was an asset light, fast growth company yeah. with huge pricing power when obviously blueberries and things went banana, you know, went yeah. bananas. Oh, Love that one. I just said that. Actually. Blueberries went bananas. Yeah, so I'll different. give you that one, Charlie. But um, to me, this is a. This is just a stock in a sector you don't need to be in. Like, I mean, it, it, agricultural production is just, you know, unforecastable. The prices of the products are unforecastable and there's very low barriers to entry in my mm. view. So if I avoided anything, it would still be Costa Group, yeah. I think, down here. That's one so I is there a like or a dislike, Paul? Um, a bit mixed. The only good news I can see a Costa, with Costa Group is it's done its three downgrades. Yeah. <laughs> what we've learned in markets is normally things come in cycles of three. Yeah. So when the first bit of bad news comes, there's usually two others that come after that. Yeah. They did and do and that. about the third is about as bad as it gets. So uh, probably a brave call, but yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. a positive. I mean, look, I do agree with Charlie. Um, I'm always getting asked questions about agricultural companies. Mm. I can't think of a single company yeah. that people make money in. So, so, so we, can, we can export agricultural products, but it's well, hard I, to make I, money. It is. I mean, I think A2 it would invest. say it's not really agricultural. Well, they don't, marketing well, they don't produce the milk. They buy the milk. You know? Yeah. So, but look, um, I think it is tough. So um, It's just the timing of cycles with yeah. the share market's short-termism, right? Yeah. Like the market wants news every six months, dividends, and you know, agricultural cycles are not aligned All right. to that. In okay, mind. well, one last one, because people will want to know, will food companies like Costa Group be positively affected if the drought breaks? Will the market say, oh, one of the negatives for all agriculture companies has been the drought. If it breaks, do you think there'll be a market reaction? Better buy food. Not so much in Costa Group, but I, look, in, in rural service stocks like Rural Co or Elders or you know, the Grain Corps of the world yeah. and things, yeah. yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. Look, I, th I think for a long-term play, mm. you know, I think people like Grain, grain Corp look all right. But mm. You're going to have to be really patient mm. because, well, the drought's out yeah. there and ain't going to be good. Um, and so you've probably got to buy the agricultural companies, you know, when... Put them in the drawer. Put it at really, when the market is really bad and yeah, not expect... Uh, not ex it's a classic cyclical, yeah, it's classic not expected to happen to turn yeah. around shortly. So as yeah. long as you can take a so, five, maybe yeah. ten year perspective... Yeah. Yeah. Buy those, okay. buy those and keep watching the Weather Channel after that. Keep watching and, and, you know, join out there and get a bale for hay, pray for rain, whatever else you do, right? But don't expect that in six months' time you're going yeah. to be sitting there with a trading profit. The okay. chances are you'll lose money in the short term. Okay. Paul Rickard and Charlie Aiken, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. It's a bit lively.